So today, the goal for today's session is we're going to do an introduction to both of these topics. If you are interested in money, which I presume most of us are, even if we don't say it out loud, um, then money can be a whole course of study all on its own. And, and certainly, uh, you know, here right now we're in the business <laughs> building. That's, you know, people that study finance. Those are the people that are really interested in, in money. So we're going to do a little bit of history of money and uh, that's going to lead into a little intro to Bitcoin. So we're just going to try to intro both of these topics. This class is not about money, okay, and it's not about Bitcoin, but it is about blockchains and cryptocurrencies, and so you can see how these are all related together. All right, question number one. So what is money? I'll give you 10 seconds to think about this. What do you think? What's money? A medium for trade. Anyone agree or disagree? Okay, it's a unit of measure. For example, how would you how would you measure something using money? As in, like a price? Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. A unit of measure, a method of trade. What else would we think money is? Credit or a common agreement? Yeah, yeah absolutely, right. So. Credit isn't necessarily the money that we might think of when we think of money, but it's an agreement with someone. You know, you come into a contract or a handshake. Um, you know, most of business is done uh, on the idea that the service is provided, and then there's an agreement that either shortly thereafter or at a specified time, you're going to pay the, pay the debt. If, let's rephrase this. Better question. Is money a technology? Or maybe another way you could say is, did humans invent or discover money? That's one that we talk about in, in physics or math, right? Was mathematics invented or discovered? You think it was invented? Yeah. Yeah. So in the, you, you could trade with something tangible. Or in more recent times, we can trade with something digital. Um, so in that sense, I would tend to agree. Money is invented. Right, so I, I guess maybe what I'm hearing from you is that money can be whatever it needs to be. And if we write down today and say a definition of money, we can say, oh, yeah, you know, these coins, like, they take a lot of effort to make. You know, we got to go smelt the metal, and then we got to go get an artist to draw the king's head and stamp on, on every single one we have to put, right? And, and, um, so if we try to set in stone a version of money, it's probably going to end up being, being outdated, um, which might be a good lens to think about money through. Meaning, what do we use today that we take for granted that is going to be outdated or superseded by, uh, by something else? OK, so you just mentioned about bonds, right? Bonds can be money as, as, as well. So, if we look back through the history of money, again, just a short history lesson here, and we think about what happens in small groups and families. So it's generally believed that humans existed in small groups, tribes, families, um, while we were you know, hunting and gathering before we sort of settled down into agriculture, right? So we're thinking like 10,000 years ago and, and so on. And if we think about a small group, even today, a small group of people, you and your immediate family members, or you and your best friends, you do not need money in order to exchange or to trade between each other, right? Particularly between family members, okay? Um, you may have, you know, some settling of accounts every now and then, but generally you can do services, trading activities, you know, you do a lot of gifting between friends and family members, and you can have quite a, you know, full thriving life without the use of money. So, you know, money in terms of the family unit, not a requirement. Families do not need to invent money. And the same thing with, like, small groups um, or small tribes, right? But as your group gets bigger, as the size increases, right, we have to think about, well, now what happens when somebody doesn't honor the debt? And so if, if, again, we think about the tribal arrangement, there's usually some head of the family, some head of the tribe, which is going to, you know, maybe act as a chief or act as a matriarch and is going to settle the debts between families accordingly. So you can think of it like, a, like your parent 
running things in the background and you don't necessarily know exactly what's going to happen. But as that group size increases, we might want a way, hey, come in, grab a seat. We might want a way in order to honor and solve that debt. So two things arise simultaneously here. Uh, one is a unit of account. So if you have a debt to a neighboring family group or tribe, you want to have a measure of what that debt is, right? Is it something that can be settled easily and quickly, or does it take a lot more time and effort in order to do? And it's simultaneous because as was mentioned just a moment ago, credit arises at the same time. So immediately, you know, maybe it's even like a marriage and there's a debt of dowry that is owed from one tribe to the next, something else like this. So immediately credit arises where you lend credit to somebody else under the expectation that they will be able to repay it. Um, and this kind of happens uh, simultaneously at different groups all around the world throughout history. And so we can sort of say that money in this sense is invented as it's needed, as that tribe grows to a bigger and bigger uh, group. And of course now the tribe is sort of almost maxed out, right? We're global uh, and so we definitely need these units of account and we need credit. In terms of the archeological record here, uh, some of the first things that were written down and preserved by humans were, you know, tallies, who owes who what. And so uh, someone or maybe some AI, uh, this was before the AI started solving some of these ancient languages, but um, you know, someone decoded this and said, well, this means that Emil needs to pay up 330 measures and, um, you know, as a bearer of the tablet, you could take the tablet uh, to the town, the town, the person controlling the grain, right? And you could say, here, I'll exchange you this bearer bond for that amount of barley in this case. So we've seen a bunch of different uses of money going through time. So coins are kind of like the, the most common in the modern era. Uh, talking about here, you know, 2,500 years ago in Greece and Turkey, the earliest coins have been dug up. And uh, metal is incredibly durable, and so that's why it was used as money. Uh, some metals are cheaper than others, and so gold coins would have, you know, more value than others, or maybe coins that are more difficult to make would have more value. Nowadays, we assign, like, some value based on if it's scarce or rare in terms of coins. Uh, in addition to the face value that we have. A uh, favorite example of people that study the history of money is the stone wheels from the island of Yap. So these are called rye stones. And uh, essentially they're giant pieces of stone, sort of like carved into a circle. Um, and what made them valuable, come on in, grab a seat. What made them valuable was that on Yap, there was no quarry to make these stones on their own. So these stones had to come from a neighboring island, and you know you weren't taking, you weren't taking the next ferry to get to the neighboring island, right? It was a multi-day canoe trip to get to neighboring islands uh, in order to collect these rye stones. Uh, and so the stones were used as sort of like a ledger, as a way to keep track of debts. People weren't carrying them around with them and exchanging them on the spot. They weren't trading them like that. Um, but because of the effort that it took to acquire the stones, they were deemed very valuable, and then they could be used as instruments of cash, of like a bearer instrument. And there's even a example of one here, you know, that didn't make it on the trip back, so it's at the bottom of the sea, um, but it's still active, right? It's still in use because, you know, they almost got it on shore. And so cash, you know, it's a very useful form of money. It's a very useful form of value transfer. Okay, let's fast forward a little bit here to, a, to about six or 700 years ago. The Medici family in Italy, they did something that really changed uh, banking in Europe. So they weren't the inventors of double entry bookkeeping, but they were really good at paperwork and they kept meticulous ledgers and they sort of standardized this process where you have two ledgers or you have a ledger with two columns such that you can keep track of 
all of the debits and credit that are going around. So the Medici family, they were the first bankers, and they were in, I believe, Florentine and Florence in Italy around the 15th century. And at that time, the Italian city-states, some of them were run by like the royal families, so there would be dukes. Um, but actually in Florence, it was one of the only ones that was run by the Medici family. So they were sort of uh, peasants that came up, made a name for themselves, and they were so good at banking that they were able to take over this city-state in absence of there being a royal family. And so we've got double entry bookkeeping, which the Medicis were very good at. And also they had this idea on the balance sheet that assets equals equities plus liabilities. And um, people from all over Europe started coming to Italy in order to bank with the Medicis. And so that system, you know, a good system is going to spread. What we'll talk about here is a distributed ledger. And sometimes this is referred to as a triple entry accounting system. So we'll come back. So that so here's a here's an idea of one of these ledgers from I guess 1573, and you know it looks kind of boring and it probably is when you read the items there, but this was their business and so they were accountants and nobody else had really done this before like the idea of banking as a business, uh, and they were wildly successful. They were the, sort of the most successful family in Europe for a little while there due to their um, due to their banking prowess. Okay, so we'll forward another couple hundred years in history now. So we've got the development of money. We've got the introduction of items to use as cash. We've got finance spread by the Medicis. If you had a ledger system and bankers you could trust, you could start to trade on your credit, which before would be a lot harder because it'd be easier for someone to run away and not come, uh, not come clean on their debts. But if you're going through an intermediary, that everybody trusts, then it's a lot easier. And so that you know, double entry system, we still use it. And today, if you take accounting classes, that's still what you learn. So if we take finance and then we blend it with computing, we're going to get to the modern system. So a quick chat about database design here. Uh, in the 1970s, places like IBM we're coming up with ways to store data in a more efficient way. So we had computers already for a little while, which meant that you could store information. But once the information piles up, it can be harder to access that information in a nice, efficient manner. And oh, by the way, if you're storing somebody's personal accounts, you better not lose that information because they're going to be upset. So you don't want to be able, or you do want to be able to be assured that information is true. And so we started to see data centers um, and maintain, that could maintain consistency between many users, meaning that if somebody at a different terminal looked at the account balance, you'd get the same information so that they were consistent. And it allowed for reliable storage, which of course we take for granted today in terms of uh, the data model that we use. And this next thing here, we'll come back to this a little bit, atomic transactions. So it allows for crashes during a write operation. So if you're reading and writing to the database, so you've got to read the database, how much does Jeff have, then we're going to debit his account a little bit, and then we're going to write the update back to the database. So the atomic transaction model says, well, actually, if something happens in between the read and the write, so I read Jeff's database, he's got 1,000, and then I'm going to debit him, say 500, but it crashes, I want to be sure that the balance comes out to what hit is truly at, right? So I don't want to then have the system start again and say that Jeff has 1,000 because I've you know, promised 500 to somebody else. That's promised out of, the, out of there. And so the atomic transaction model says either the whole thing happens or it doesn't. So the word atomic means you can't split it in two. So you can't devise it any further. And we'll come back to this. A lot of blockchain smart contract systems operate under an atomic transaction model, meaning you can do a bunch of clever things in the transaction, but if something happens partway through, it kind of rolls back. And so you don't get stuck in this interim state. Um, and so it's kind of like boring database stuff unless you're a database engineer, but it's really important in terms of global finance because nowadays we take for granted the idea that these ledgers are accurate 
and always available and consistent. And oh, by the way, we transition away from paper, so we're you know, almost completely transitioned away from paper into the digital. There is still a little bit of paper in the finance system. OK, so the traditional finance system that we partake in today has merged finance and computing. So you know, what do we have? We have digital double entry accounting. Nobody's writing out the books by hand anymore. Um, you know, not even not even grandma that's like doing the accounts for a small business, right? Everyone's using personal software, like really cheap uh, small business software to do it. We have centralized databases. So just like the Medici's were centralized banking in Europe, you would go, you'd physically go to them to open an account uh, and then be able to conduct your trading, right? We have the same thing. You physically have to go to A and Z, whether it's online or in person. Uh, and you have to say, you know, I want to bank with you. And so that's a centralized point from our point of view. We also have a permanent record of transactions. So it's very, very rare that a bank will mess up, um, especially if it's you owing them money. Right? It's very, very rare that that's going to slip through um, because databases are really good. And of course, money is their business. So there's lots of checks, lots of checks there. Um, I guess another keyword here is accounting. So this is kind of like standard accounting practices were started in the era of the Medici's. I'll highlight this word too, right? It's a permanent record of transactions. Um, and so again, it's very hard to call up your bank and say, hey, can you delete my transaction data? Uh, uh, I only want to keep, you know, three months of transaction data, for example, for whatever reason, right? So it's it's a permanent record, and um, you know that, from your point of view, might be good or it might be less than good. Okay, so traditional finance, we're probably here for a little bit of the alternate finance ideas. So the question is, what could go wrong, right, with the traditional method? OK, so as an example, there's, there's lots of these in the history of finance. But here's an example of what you would get in Venezuela in 2018 to buy a kilogram of tomatoes. You had to spend 5 million Venezuelan bolivars. So I brought some bolivars with me today. So I'm going to pass some of these around. If <laughs> uh, maybe. If, um, if you get two of the same, two of different color, okay, uh, compare them. So Venezuela has not, the situation there has not improved by much. Um, but this was from a photo essay in The Independent. And it was like, it's like almost comical, people having to spend wheelbarrows full of cash to buy ordinary things. And then it progresses to the point where the paper money is worthless. And so you've got, you know, uh, artisans turning the paper money into crafts, folding it into wallets for tourists to buy, and then necklaces and things like this. Um, you know, or even like sci-fi styles, like burning money to stay warm because of the heat that it can produce. Uh, and so being in New Zealand, it's really hard to appreciate, definitely hard for me to appreciate. Um, if you haven't been and had to live in a country where they're in monetary strife, like this, and, and they really have issues with their financial system. And so one of the criticisms of Bitcoin is that uh, we don't need it, and it is you know, promoting sort of unhealthy activity in the financial system. And, the, and that's a real Western world criticism, because if you have stable banking, like in New Zealand, then for sure you might not need Bitcoin at all. But uh, you know, we're all here at a university. We can see how incredibly diverse it is and the places that we come from and visit. And so hopefully, you know, we don't have to think too far to a place that might be uh, not as financially stable as in New Zealand. So we'll come back to the notes in a second. Here's the graph from Wikipedia of the inflation in Venezuela, or to be more accurate, the hyperinflation in Venezuela. So what we're looking at here is a logarithmic graph. 
So time is on the x-axis, and that's linear. Value is on the y-axis, and that's logarithmic. So every step is 10 times the difference. And what we see here in the vertical sections is how long it takes for the value to lose 99%. So if you had $1, after this amount of time, it was worth one cent. And then after this amount of time, again, it was worth 0 0.01 cent. And then again, it's 100 times lower or 99% lower in, in value. And so we can measure this in how long does it take to go down. So we had four years, and we had just over a year, and we had less than a year, and then the line changes to red. It goes from blue to red. And that is because it got so intense that there was nothing to do except to devaluate the currency and print new money. And so that what they do is they say, well, instead of it saying 100 on the note that you're holding, now it says 100,000. And you go like, and you go like, <laughs> whoa, uh, like all of the life savings that I just had is now, you know, worth one one thousandth or less of what it used to be. And it didn't even get better then. Another 10 months in 2019, another 17 months in 2020. And, you know, this chart is compiled by third party sources, economists and researchers. Of course, the Venezuelan central bank, they are not... Um, publicly uh, publishing this information. Um, and some of these charts, the value is inferred because just that the central bank isn't publishing statistics about what's happening. So a really dreadfully terrible situation. So the blue line here is the BSF, which is one of the boulevards, and then they changed it to the S issue here in red, and then the BSD parallel rate uh, is just kicking in a new one at the end of the graph, September 2021. Okay, so back to the Venezuelan notes that I passed around. They're, they're real notes. Um, I bought them on eBay. Like I said, they're worthless, uh, except maybe for exporting you know, to someone in New Zealand that wants to study this type of thing or for making arts and crafts. Right, so what do you notice about the notes? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So we went from, and it's the exact same note, <coughs> they did change the color. So that, you know, if you're a merchant, you can easily tell without having to read it, right? But this is 100 boulevards. Next printing in 2017, 100,000 boulevards. And so that's, that's a currency devaluation. And, you know, they didn't have any extra money. It's the exact same it's the exact same note, right? It's the exact same guy. They didn't get a new designer. You know, they changed the color of the ink, and they updated the date, and they updated the signature, right? Uh, and they added the word thousand, uh, and, and, and that was it. Um, I don't have it with me, but there's an example as well in uh, Zimbabwe. Okay, so in Zimbabwe, you can buy like a $100 trillion note. And it was so hilarious that all the zeros wouldn't fit on the note. So they had to change the font size to squish the zeros to fit on the printing of the new banknote when they devalued to, to that extent. Uh, so, you know, very, very interesting, I think, from my point of view, but also... Uh, very sad and like one of the worst injustices that can happen, you know, from uh, a government that supposedly wants to do best by its people to enact monetary policies that end up uh, where you have to take a whole pallet of cash to buy your groceries. Okay, so that's just a little bit of color, a little bit of background as to the traditional financial system, right? We still live in this world, still runs most of the modern world, um, but maybe that's starting to change with the idea of digital cash. Next up, we're going to introduce the double spend problem and its relationship to digital abundance. And then in part three, we're going to introduce Bitcoin and how does it tackle the double spend problem.